Good evening, everyone. We'll kick off our March 8, 2021 planning meeting. Just note that we haven't had a separate planning meeting for probably five or six years. So this is uh, something we're doing new to spread things out and allow us to spend more time on topics. So over to you, Judy. Thank you, Mayor Canna. This evening, I'd like to start with the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we are on the lands of Anisha Nebe Nation. This spot where we gather is the traditional lands of the Three Fires Confederacy, the Ottawa, Potawatomi, and Ojibwe. We also recognize that this land is now home to the Delaware Nation. This land was settled through the McKee Purchase Treaty of 1790, and we, as beneficiaries of the treaty, must recognize our responsibilities, including our collective responsibilities to the land and water. Mr. Mayor, there is no uh, supplementary agenda this evening. And we have one conflict of interest, and that is Councillor Wright on item 9F. Okay, with that, we'll go into planning. Thank you, Mayor Kenneth. Process to be followed for each planning application will be as follows. One, the clerk will announce each individual planning item. Two, the clerk will advise if any written submissions have been received regarding a planning item. If so, the clerk will read the written submissions that have been received. Three, for any items where a written submission is received, administration will proceed with the presentation. Four, council will be asked if it has any questions of administration or the applicant if present. Five, council will be asked what direction it wishes to take with regard to the item. Notice, if any person or public body that files an appeal of a decision of council in respect of the proposed applications does not make a submission to the municipal clerk of the corporation of the municipality of Chatham-Kent before the proposal is approved, they are not entitled to appeal a decision to the local planning appeal tribunal if otherwise eligible, unless in the opinion of the tribunal, there are reasonable grounds to add the person or public body as party to the appeal. Information on Council's actions tonight will be posted on the Municipal website. All persons who have made a request or, have, or who have made a submission regarding a particular planning item will receive a Notice of Council's decision, including appeal procedures. Any other pers person who wishes to receive a Notice of Decision must submit a written request to the Municipal Clerk. Thank you. Okay, so the first planning application is 9A, Application for Consent and Zoning Bylaw Amendment, CKVPC Realty Corporation, 117 Erie Street South, Community of Richtown, East Kent. Mr. Mayor, we have the applicant online. We have not received any deputations on this matter. Councillor Wright and Councillor Pinsonell, can I get you with this on the floor, please? I'll make a, make a motion to move that, thank you. And I'll second it, Your Worship. Any questions? Hearing none, we'll put it to vote. All votes are in. Mm -hmm. Motion passes. Moving on to planning uh, B. Application for Consent and Zoning Bylaw Amendment 2715135 Ontario Inc. 21055 Charing Cross Road, Community of Harwich, South Kent. Mr. Mayor, the applicant is on the line and we have received one deputation for this item and I will read it now. Municipal Council, I received the above notice. I live at 8594 James Street, Charing Cross, straight across Charing Cross Road from the Sweden Freeze Restaurant. I make opposition to this proposal for the future commercial development. I do not want to have a gas station built in Charing Cross community. Traffic turning on and off into County Road 10 into the fuel station seems very dangerous to me. Canadians are hard pressed to meet challenging targets for decreasing carbon emissions from the federal government if we allow more gas tanks to be buried in the ground. We need to be thinking more of services to promote green energy, perhaps an electric electric vehicle charging station. Gasoline with poison will poison the ground with chemicals. In the future, we are not going to be using as much fuel. Many automotive automobile manufacturers are planning to make electric and hybrid vehicles. 
So the long-term effects of gas stations will have a negative impact on the emissions targets we are all trying to achieve. Council representatives, please use your best judgment in considering this zoning amendment, which I oppose. Beverly Ben Dyken. Uh, Mr. Jacques, over to you. Thank you, Mayor Ganeth. The municipalities received uh, two planning applications for this property at 21055 Charing Cross Road. Uh, the first is an application uh, to sever the lot into two resulting parcels. Uh, the property itself is about three and one quarter acres in area today. Uh, the proposal would split the lot into a property approximately eight tenths of an acre in area fronting Charing Cross Road, uh, which would leave uh, the re remaining property of approximately two and a half acres uh, uh, toward the back lot or rear of the property. Uh, the purpose of the consent or the severance is to facilitate new commercial development on the eight tenths of an acre property fronting Charing Cross Road and reserve the right for future development on the remaining property in the rear of the lands. Uh, the second application that was submitted with regards to this property is a zoning bylaw amendment application. Uh, the zoning bylaw amendment is uh, more of a technical matter. As you can see here in this uh, diagram, I'll, I'll quickly try to explain it. Um, the property is split zoned. Uh, so currently the front of the property is zoned highway commercial, uh, which uh, would permit a wide range of, of future commercial uses. Uh, but a consequence to the developer's plans, the uh, frontage that is zoned highway commercial only extends to a depth of 100 feet. Uh, the back lot or the remaining portions of the lands are zoned in the deferred development zone, which do not permit development as of right and to permit development in the rear of the lands a zoning application would need to be made at some point in the future so to facilitate the development of the proposed severed lot fronting charing cross road the zoning amendment would rezone approximately the the back half of the proposed severed parcel from deferred development to highway commercial matching those the zoning of the front of the lands uh, the result is that the front lot is zoned commercial to a depth of 200 feet and this would facilitate future redevelopment of the property. Uh, with regard to the letter uh, received, um, there were two issues raised. The first was with regard to traffic. Uh, Chatham Kent administration did not identify any concerns related to traffic in this area. Uh, Charing Cross Road through the community here is uh, classified as what we call a rural arterial road. Uh, this is the classification of road that is designed and meant to uh, handle large volumes of traffic and uh, proposed redevelopment at the site is not anticipated to have any negative effect on the function of the municipal roadway. Uh, with respect to the second part of the letter uh, regarding uh, uh, the trend to alternative fuel sources and electric vehicles, etc. Uh, well, this is uh, relevant to long term land use planning. Um, Today and for the foreseeable future over the next couple of decades, uh, gas stations are going to continue to be a part of the land use uh, planning uh, mix in our municipality and, and across uh, other municipalities as well for the foreseeable future. Um, however, uh, a property like this uh, developed as a gas station in the future obviously would be conducive to perhaps changing over to things like electric charging, uh, etc. Uh, when the automobile industry uh, eventually transitions to more electric vehicles on the roadways. Therefore, it is recommended that consent application file B 12220 to sever and convey a new parcel approximately 2.4 acres in area, shown as parts two and three on the applicant sketch, together with the permanent easement over part two of the severed parcel in favor of the retained parcel, parcel shown as part one to permit a reciprocal access usage in part of lot 22, concession four West Communication Road in the community of Harwich be approved, subject to the conditions noted in the planning report dated February 8, 2021. And secondly, that zoning bylaw amendment application file D14 HA 5820 be approved and the implementing bylaw be adopted. Thank you. Councillor Sakachi and Councillor Thompson, can I get you put this on the floor, please? I'll put it on the floor, Mayor Kenneth. Uh I will second it to start the conversation, sure. 
Okay, any questions? Uh, Councillor Sakachi, followed by Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you through you, Mayor Kenneth. Uh, I just wanted to thank uh, Ryan for the, the conversation that we had uh, today. I, I, I did have some clarification. I think that uh, one thing that was uh, I was confused when reading the, uh, the the report, it was very well done. It's just, uh, just correct me if I'm wrong, wrong, Ryan. So if if there wasn't to be a little bit of an expansion on the commercial property, would they still be uh, able to put a, a gas station there, let's say, if it was just a little bit smaller? Thank you, Mayor Kenneth. Yes, that's correct. Um, any commercial use, including a gas station, would be permitted uh, on the front 100 feet of the property without any applications to council. And, and currently, it, how the property sits uh, right now. <clears throat> so, so basically, is the, the 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 building that's currently there right now? Is it, it just so I can kind of kind of get of a, an overview because I'm so familiar with the area? You had a wonderful picture over top. Um, but is that whole building, like how far on that building uh, essentially right now would be 100 feet? Does that capture that building currently right now? Or is there actually an over, uh, you know, flow of the building currently? Yeah, that's a good question. So currently the commercial zoning only extends back approximately half the depth of the building. Uh, so the back half of the building and the buildings, uh, outbuildings to the rear of the uh, main building are not actually in the commercial zone. Um, through our review, um, we did view the Township of Harwich zoning bylaw as well to understand if there was perhaps uh, an error over time in transitioning to the Chatham Kent zoning bylaw and there wasn't. I can't explain why the, the zone depth only went to 100 feet. However, the average depth of the neighboring properties is 200 feet. So, uh, so in my opinion, it's totally appropriate to bring the commercial zone back to that full 200 foot depth. Thank you. Thank you. And last question for you, uh, uh, Mr. Jakes, is, is uh, so just because I'm still kind of getting used to this, uh, the whole planning process and that. So when this is actually, uh, this is approved, the the developer still has to come back with uh, site, site, site approved planning. Is that correct? That's correct. So if approved uh, and the approvals are implemented uh, after tonight, um, a new lot will be created and that new lot fronting Charing Cross Road will be zoned highway commercial in its entirety. Um, okay. Oh, sorry. sorry. No, you go ahead. Sorry, I apologize. Oh, that sets the property up for actual physical development on the site. Um, so, prior to obtaining a building permit, uh, a commercial property is required to go through what's called site plan approval. Uh, site plan approval is is mainly a technical exercise. Um, it includes approval of a drawing that shows the site layout, the location of any buildings. Uh, parking, laneways, and other facilities. It also includes uh, detailed servicing plans for things such as uh, water, wastewater, and stormwater management. Uh, when these uh, drawings are submitted and approved in line with Chatham Kent's development standards, um, uh, this particular uh, property would be able to be approved uh, by administration and the developer would be able to move forward and obtain building permits for construction. Thank you. And last uh, question for you, then, uh, Mr. Jakes, is so would the would that be an opportunity for the the neighbor uh, abutting um, residents to you know to provide feedback once that uh, you know the actual site plan is uh, you know submitted to to CK? Um, is, is that when they're going to take kind of capture the you know the concerns as well as uh, you know the different kind of maybe mitigation efforts they can put in place to ensure that um, you know it's going to be um, you know you know, a significant less impact on the, the neighboring areas. Mm -hmm. um, unlike the severance and rezoning process, uh, the site plan approval process is not a public process. So there, there is not a uh, public notice with regard to the, the site plan application itself. Uh, however, um, I need to point out that there are certain uh, zoning standards put in place where commercial properties abut residential properties. So through the site plan process, uh, there will be a provision for uh, some screening and buffering on the side yards where the property abuts uh, residential uses. As well, Chatham Kent's development standards uh, have lighting uh, policies which require any uh, lighting from a commercial property not to um, shine onto to neighboring properties as well. Uh, and there are other uh, development standards that are, are closely considered uh, when reviewing the site plan uh, when it comes in prior to it being approved. Thank you. 
Thank you. And that's all my questions, uh, Mayor Canop. I appreciate the, the floor. Thank you. Councillor Thompson, followed by Councillor Bondi. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, did I hear that correctly in that there won't be an opportunity for residents to see a final site plan before approval? Thank you, Mayor Caniff. Yes, that's correct. Can I make an amendment that uh, this return to council for uh, final approval then? I think it's important that uh, the residents of Charing Cross who have expressed some some concerns to me get a chance to, to see this this project before uh, final approval goes ahead. Um, they, they do have some concerns in regards to the, the lighting aspect as well as just the how it's going to impact their uh, their community. So I, I think it would be important uh, to add that into uh, the process. So I would make that amendment if I could get a seconder. Well, the, the amendment, uh, so Councillor Sakachi, you good with that amendment? Thank you, Mayor Kane. If, if if that's something that, uh, that that's not going to cause a significant issue, I'm I'm okay with that uh, for sure. Uh, Mr. Jacques, does that create any big issues for you, or just for the process as, as a whole? Just Thank you, Mayor Uh I, Just just a one comment, uh, perhaps. Um, if council's direction is for the for council to be the approval authority for the site plan, um, th that that's something that we certainly can accommodate. Council often approves site plans uh, uh, for larger sites. Um, I would have to ask for clarification if it's anticipated that the site plan would involve some sort of public notice or or rather if it would simply be listed on a regular council meeting agenda as a site plan typically is and residents would need to see that on the agenda and uh, make a deputation on a regular agenda item because a site plan would not come back to a public uh, planning meeting such as this. Thank you. Councillor Thompson, uh, what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm I'm comfortable with uh, the the way we are our, our normal process to have it return to a regular council meeting I'm, and uh, for residents to give deputations at that point. Uh, like I said, I think it's just important that uh, the residents uh, in the in the area get a, another chance to see exactly what is what is going to go in there and what it's going to look like because uh, whilst um, I'm in favor of development, and I think uh, most of the residents there are too. I think it's just a little bit of a step too far to uh, to say that we're going to go ahead and do this and not have an opportunity for folks to see exactly what is going on before it, before it actually comes to fruition. Okay, uh, Councillor Bondi, followed by Councillor Latimer. Councillor Bondi, if you're speaking, you're still on mute. Okay, am I there now? Yes, you're there. Hello? Go ahead, Councillor Bondi. Okay, great. Thank, thank you, Mary Ken. Uh Ryan, a question which may be um, an objective question, but uh, first of all, I want to say I'll really miss Sweden Freeze. A lot of memories there as a child. <clears throat> but if this becomes a a, a gas station, which are considered very um, notorious, sort of like dry cleaners, because of environmental concerns. Would a gas station be in proximity to neighbors? Would that have any effect on property values? And just, you know, gas stations aren't exactly loved by, you know, realtors and, and assessments. And, and, and I know you may not be able to comment on that, but because it's, you know, it is a gas station, it's not a fruit stand. Does that does that affect the um, the future potential reselling values of the neighbor? If you can answer, in which Brian, I understand, maybe you can't. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Caniff. Uh, so fundamentally, one of the things that zoning overall does it zones uh, like uses near to one another to minimize the amount of uh, conflicting land uses that that may lead to market conditions that uh, could affect uh, property value. However. Um, property value in itself is not taken into consideration uh, when analyzing a, a planning application. 
uh, my comment on, on this particular uh, property is that I have to point out that the, the property is already zoned uh, commercial and would permit a wide range of commercial uses. So I think to some extent that the existing commercial zoning of the property over time is already contributing to market conditions in the area and um, to the effect that redevelopment would have at this site uh, is unclear whether or not that would result in further you know positive or negative changes in surrounding property values thank you and thank you mary Kenneth. Uh, ryan just another quick question which excuse my ignorance on this but when it does come to um zoning and potential business usages such as a gas station is there any accommodation for environmentally sensitive businesses again you know a fruit stand versus a gas station one's going to have mm -hmm. you know you understand where i'm going there thanks Ryan. yeah thank you for the question uh and perhaps uh when my presentation is finished uh, the applicant or their agent may have further comments to make on this particular point it's not my area of expertise uh, but I do know that the Technical Standards and Safety Association, the TSSA, uh, regulates um, gas stations. This is a provincial agency that uh, specifically addresses uh, the construction and continued operation and maintenance of these uh, facilities. Uh, this would be a brand new facility uh, built to the high standards of the day, uh, which have evolved over time from perhaps what gas station development uh, consisted of in the past. But uh, beyond that, it's regulated by the TSSA. Unfortunately, I can't provide further information on that point. Mr. French, can you add anything to, uh, to, the, to the conversation? Sure, can you hear me there, Mayor Canna? Yes, we can. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Caniff, and through to Councillor Bondi and to uh, the rest of Council. The, the current design standards uh, for gas stations are uh, very highly regulated, as Ryan said, by the TSSA. Uh, new tank materials are designed to last a lot longer than the, the older systems that may uh, have caused contamination in the past. Each tank has monitoring systems uh, built in. Uh, the the province and the other uh, regulating authorities see current tank design as actually a very safe and stable uh, system. So uh, I appreciate the uh, the concerns about uh, contamination. Uh, however, the uh, the current design uh, required by uh, the regulating agencies. Uh, work uh, very hard to uh, to prevent any contamination whatsoever. Well, that's great. Thank you through you, Mayor Kenneth. Thank you very much, Ryan and Mr. French. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Latimer followed by Councillor Pinsonal. Thank you through the mayor. Um, actually, Ryan, Councillor Thompson's amendment took care of my concern for additional or extended community engagement. And your comments and Mr. French's comments uh, covered my questions about uh, environmental impacts and, and uh, accommodation. So thank you very much for the presentation tonight. Councillor Pinsonal. Uh, thank you, Worship. For you to uh, Ryan. Um, doesn't our planning uh, process right now, don't, doesn't it already uh, cover like lighting and nuisance issues for neighbors? Like, isn't that just part standard part of our uh, planning process? when they do the site approval? Thank you, Mayor Caniff. Yes, that's correct. The, the site plan approval process uh, looks at all of those things, um, buffering and screening, such as landscaping and fencing. Um, I could likely predict that uh, solid board fencing, as well as some level of landscaping will be required uh, on the property lines at certain locations to help uh, mitigate the commercial use uh, impacts from the nearby residential uses uh, as well. Um, Chatham Ken has uh, quite, uh, quite specific lighting standards that require the developer to submit 
uh, what's called a, a lighting plan and photometric data, which actually takes into consideration the on-site lighting design and shows uh, the intensity of light uh, shining at various locations on the property. And it's to, to prove that uh, there is no light directly shining on neighboring uh, properties. These are just a couple of the uh, built-in development standards and zoning standards that are considered through the site plan process. Thank you. That's what I thought. Um, so the way the property stands right now, and I think I heard you say this, they could build that gas station if they wanted anyhow, correct? If it was feasible in, in the very front portion of the property, that's correct. Okay. So this amendment, um, and I don't have any problem with the amendment, I think it is good to get the uh, community involved, or the neighborhood, I should say. Um, does this affect the proposal itself in any way where in the end it could be overturned? Uh, I don't believe so. Uh, the Chatham Kent Council has passed uh, what's called the Site Plan Control Bylaw. Uh, this bylaw regulates that essentially all non residential development is subject to site plan approval. Um, so, this includes any commercial property that's developing or redeveloping. Inside of that uh, bylaw, the details set out that. Council is the approval authority for developments uh, with the projected construction value of over $2 million, and that uh, construction projects with an estimated value of under $2 million are delegated to administration. Uh, so it is very common, and it's part of uh, the municipality's regular business that council does approve uh, site plans. However, it's typically those, uh, those larger projects and those, the reason for that somewhat is that these larger projects over $2 million uh, may have a, a greater degree of impact on the community. And not just from a land use compatibility standpoint, but also from a social, economic or environmental standpoint as well. Typically site plans that are, are lower in value uh, have a lower relative impact. But that's not to say that council uh, can't approve the uh, site plans of those values. It's it's fully within council's purview to request that. Thank you. Okay, so that that makes sense. So tonight we are passing the uh, the bylaw for them to go ahead, but we get the last look at the uh, site proposal. Correct. Correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Seeing no other questions, we'll put it to vote. All votes are in. Motion passes. Moving on to 9C, application for zoning bylaw amendment, B. Erickson Manufacturing Limited, 11297 Merritt Line, Community of Chatham Township. Uh, there have been no deputations received this, e this evening and the applicant is not on the line. Councillor McGrail and Councillor Foss, can I get you to put this on the floor, please? Sure, I'll put the motion forward. Happy to second. Any questions? Hearing none, we'll put it to vote. All votes are in. Motion passes. 9D, application for consent and zoning bylaw amendment. Mary Lucier. 5731 Rivard Line, Community of Dover, North Kent. There were no deputations received this evening and the applicant is on the line. Councillor Foss and Councillor McGrail, can I get you to put this on the floor, please? Happy to move. And second. Any questions? Hearing none, we'll put it to vote. Missing one vote, councillors. Please remember to hit submit. All votes are in. Motion passes.
9E, Application for Zoning Bylaw Amendment, Pinehurst Resources Limited, 21960 Mall Road, Community of Harwich, South Kent. There are no deputations received this evening and the applicant is on the line. Councillor Thompson and Councillor Latimer, can I get you to put this on the floor, please? Yep, happy to move it. So to second. Any questions? Seeing none, we'll put it to vote. Madam Clerk, I'm just, it's not allowing me to uh, to vote on this one here. So do, would you like my vote uh, verbally? Sure. Yes. Thank you. All votes are in, motion passes. And we'll make note of that uh, in the minutes, Councillor Sakachi. thank you. Moving on to 9F, application for consent and zoning bylaw amendment, Larry and Rosemary Van Gerven, 21049 Base Road, Community of Harwich. We have one conflict of interest by Councillor Wright. No deputations were received on this matter and the applicant is on the line. Councillor Latimer and Councillor Scotchy, can I get you put this on the floor, please? Please to put it on the floor. Happy to second that, Mayor Caniff. Any questions? Hearing none, we'll put it to vote. Madam Clerk, I'm, I'm unfortunately I'm still not able to select my uh, my response. Would you like it verbally again? Yes, please. Uh, I'm a yes as well. Thank you. And all votes are in. And motion passes. Okay, we'll move to item ten: development charges bylaw appeal. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this evening, Council, before we start, because this is something new um, that uh, Council has not dealt with before, I'd just like to, uh, uh, for the public's benefit and yourself, uh, read out what is happening this evening and why. So the process for the development charges appeal and the next steps following Council's decision are as follows. The Development Charges Act provides a process for a person who is subject to a development charge to raise a complaint with Council for the following reasons. One, the amount of the development charge was incorrectly determined. Two, whether a credit is available to be used against the development charge or the amount of the credit or the service with respect to which the credit was given was incorrectly determined. Or three, there was an error in the application of the development charge bylaw. The complaint must include the person's name and address and outline the reasons for the complaint. This information is submitted to Council Council is then required to hold a hearing in which we are doing this evening regarding the complaint and allow the complainant to make representation. A complainant should be given the opportunity to put forward any reasonable evidence that they feel supports their complaint. After the hearing, the evidence and submissions of the complainant, Council will have an opportunity to ask the complainant questions, receive information from administration and ask questions of administration. This is outlined in your agenda this evening. Council will then debate the matter and pass a motion. If Council is of the opinion that there is an incorrect determination under the bylaw or that there is an error in the application of the bylaw, it may pass a motion to rectify those issues. If Council is of the opinion that there is no incorrect determination or error in the application of the bylaw, Council may dismiss the complaint. Following Council's decision, the complainant will receive a written decision from the clerk's office. Following the complainant may appeal the decision to the local planning appeals tribunal. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, I will start this. So, Mrs. Evans, Ms. Evans, can yeah. you please uh, make your presentation? Okay, so do um, you want me just to read? Has everybody read it or just do you want me to read it? I'm a pretty fast reader. Yes, please, uh, if you could read it, that would be okay. great. Okay. Um, we purchased a service lot at 432 Agnes Street in Wallsford with the intent of building a small house suitable for a disabled, homeless, senior relative of ours. Um, because of the fact that our relative only received CPP and old age security from the government, it was imperative that we look for options to keep the cost as low as possible. 
buying a house in this inflated market was not an option, and he certainly doesn't have enough money, uh, monthly income to afford renting. And even with the low income, there's a long waiting list. He's been living with myself and my husband for over two and a half years, and it's time that he has a place of his own. So the best option we felt was for us to purchase a lot and build a small house for him. The house we are building is a modest 24 feet by 36 feet, which is 864 square feet. It's a one story and will be accessible for his disability. So in November, I received an email uh, that my permit was ready. However, the outstanding fees totaled $7,726 and it had to be paid before I received the permit. So I then contacted uh, Mr. Magliero at the municipality to question those development charges that totaled $5,207 for water and sewer. I couldn't understand it. Mr. Magliero explained that these changes were added, the charges were added by the PUC and that I would have to contact them. I was told that the fee would have been waived had the house that was previously on the lot been torn down five years ago. But since that house was torn down 10 years ago, I was out of luck. I would think, you know, that the municipality would be happy that we're paying taxes now, maybe on a, on a lot that has sat vacant for over 10 years. So then I contacted uh, someone else and, and um, they told me to contact with him, Sutherland. I think that's how it's Sunderland. Uh, and he told me that it was out of his hands as it was a bylaw that was passed some five years ago. I advised him I wanted to appeal the decision and he was able to put the development fees on hold so that I could uh, pay for the permit and allow us to move forward with the construction, which we did. So then he also advised me of the complaint process and who I should forward it to. So in my opinion, I believe the development charges were unfairly applied to the lot um, for these reasons. The lot is not in a newly developed area. It's located on an older, well-established street in Wallaceburg that requires no infrastructure development. There is absolutely no new development going on in the area of our lot. Every house in the street is older. Our priority is to keep the cost down to make it affordable for our relative to be able to live. Because of this fact, we asked our real estate agent as well as our lawyer to absolutely ensure the lot was serviced prior to us purchasing it, purchasing it and to ensure that there were no financial underlying issues. We would not have bought the lot had we known that an additional $5,207 is going to be added by the municipality. We felt we paid a lot for the lot being at 48,000, but that's sort of the, the trend nowadays. Um, we made adjustments to the size of the house uh, that we could afford to build because of the cost of the lot. We certainly could not afford that 5,200 uh, for these development charges. The real estate and the lawyer both told me that it was told us that it was a service lot and when they searched the title, nothing showed up. So no information was given on this development fee, what it's for. Uh, I, I definitely see the logic behind development charges in a new, newly developed area where all the infrastructure has to be established, but it's simply not the case. It was just like a surprise. Like I'm thinking for future, it should be part of that, um, you know, when the lawyer checks the property and does that title search, I would have thought it should have showed up there so that we could make, when we made a decision on purchasing the lot, we would have known right off the hop that there's 5,200, there's some kind of fee going to be added to it. I can tell you, we paid, we bought, we were able to scrounge enough to have kitchen cup, all the kitchen cupboards for the house and all of the flooring for less than this 5,200. Um, so that, that was a, a bit disturbing, hence why I, I'm appealing it. Um, so in summation, I'm just hoping that special consideration can be given to our situation. I don't believe that the fee is fair in our case, as I don't see what are we benefiting for getting these, from paying these development fees. I doubt that we're getting all new piping and water lines down the street to our new home. Also, I was advised that the size of the house does not matter with respect to how these development charges are established. I mean, as far as I know, even permit fees are based on the square footage of a new structure but we have to pay the same amount for an 864 square foot house that someone would pay if they were could afford to build a three or four thousand square foot house i just feel that's not maybe consistent or fair this extra 5207 dollars for development fees should we have to pay will most definitely impact the completion of our house we are on such a tight budget that it will make the difference of a relative having furniture flooring uh, etc as it stands we are planning on purchasing cabinets 
some vanities, some inside doors, and anything we can find used or at the restores as buying everything new is not going to be an option. Um, 5,200 may not seem like a large sum in the municipality, but it is huge when we have such a modest, limited budget to complete the house for our relatives. So any consideration you give to waiving these development charges would be really appreciated. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Is it, council have any questions of Ms. Evans? Seeing no questions, uh, we'll move it over to uh, Mr. Sunderland. Thank you, Mary Dickenoff. I'll provide a briefing on the council report supplied for tonight's meeting. Uh, so Mr. and Mrs. Evans applied for a building permit on this vacant property in Wolfsburg in November 2020. At that time, they discovered they had to pay water and wastewater development charges. As part of the fees for the building permit, uh, the 2020 water uh, development charges equaled $2,880. The wastewater development charges equaled $2,327 they needed to be paid uh, in order to get the building permit. This makes the total fees for water and wastewater development charges of $5,200 and seven. Uh, $5, and seven. Uh, development charges have been in existence since November 19, 90, 1989 with the passage of the Development Charges Act. Chatham County Council originally passed the Development Charge Bylaw in 2004, and then the DC bylaw has been replaced since then in 2009, 2014, and 2019. Development charges are collected to pay for the waterworks, the water treatment plant, water supply, which means trans main transmission mains, uh, water storage and pump stations, the wastewater side, wastewater treatment, and trunk sewers. The property in Wallaceburg has never paid development charges at the time it was originally developed many years ago. The city of Chatham was the only one that had DCs at the time of amalgamation. The property at 432 Agnes Street in Wallsburg has both water and sanitary services to the property line. This is because, um, this, because of this, they are not being charged the sanitary sewer tapping fees that would be normally uh, charged on a brand new property. Uh, the tapping fees would be $1,000 plus actual cost for the sanitary and the water service tapping fee would be $4,000. These fees are from the 2021 water and wastewater rates and fees bylaw. The property had a previous residential dwelling on it that had been demolished in 2010. In accordance with section 3.13 of the Municipal, Municipality of Chatham-Kent development charges bylaw, development charges are only exempt or reduced for developments if the time span between the date of demolition and the new permit is within 60 months or five years or less. In this case, it has been 10 years since the previous home was demolished. So the development charges were applied for both water and wastewater as they were written in the bylaw. Watson and Associates was hired by the PUC to update the DC bylaw in 2019. They handle over 160 clients, which are municipalities and utilities in Ontario. We asked them if this section of the DC bylaw is a standard clause across the province and is, and is a consistent rule with other municipalities. And they responded, yes, it is. Municipalities close to us that have this clause in the DC uh, include the town of Essex, Lakeshore, Central Elgin, and Sarnia. So for example, and how we compare, if we take this property and place it in Lakeshore, they would be paying a water and wastewater development charge of $12,000. And then add Lakeshore's municipal DCs to that, the total would be $26,000 for DCs all rolled in. The PUC and the building department staff have applied all the correct rules and charges as it is stated in the DC bylaw. A concern for administration is by not charging DCs in this property, it would lead to similar other requests from owners and developers in the future. For an additional note, I had talked to Mrs. Evans like she had stated in December 2020. She expressed to me she had a contractor ready to start for mater and materials ordered for the build. I also agreed to hold off payment of the DCs in this property for eight months to allow her to start her construction and work through the DC complaint process like we are here today. This information was sent to the building department and Mrs. E and Mrs. Evans on December 15, 2020, so she can get her building permit. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
Uh, any questions? Councillor Sakachi, followed by Councillor Foss. Thank you, Mayor Kenneth. This is just a process question to, to Mr. Sutherland. Um, is this a normal process that uh, it comes into, uh, uh, you know, basically a live, um, you know, public meeting of council in regards to these things and other municipalities? So this is a, a complainant on our DC bylaw, our DC charges bylaw. Uh, this process is written within our bylaw, and Mr. Taylor can probably explain a little bit further. But this is the first time we've been at uh, council with an appeal. Uh, thank and you, Mr. Only, Chair. And just, just, just the only reason, just to clarify why I'm asking, is just that um, Ms. Evans has, has, you know, kind of explained her situation in a very detailed manner, and and I think that it would probably. I know if I was the applicant, I, I would think that it would be probably beneficial for myself to go through the process, but to have it uh, uh, as a public uh, process, I mean, I'm, I'm just, just curious to see if that's standardized throughout the, uh, you know, she she, re she revealed some, uh, you know, some very uh, private information, and I'm just curious if that's standard across the other municipalities that we put, uh, you know, people that are appealing kind of in this kind of, uh, uh, you know, limelight like this, so to speak. Thank you, Mr. Mayor through you um this is standard written in uh most in dc bylaws across the province is this a, a appeal process or sorry um it would be complaint process it's written in there so uh, it's common whether it's uh it's taken to this uh extent extent in other municipalities i'm not aware of dave did you mr. want to add to that yes thank you mr mayor this is david taylor director of legal services uh so this is um originally actually comes from uh, the development charges uh, legislation the development charges act that the uh, province has passed and it specifically states that uh, complaints of this nature go to council as Ms. smith uh, identified at the beginning of the um, appeal this is not something that has come to this council or any time uh, in the last 10 years that i've been here we haven't had one of these complaints so it is actually possible to uh, have council delegate uh, this type of appeal hearing to uh, a different body, so something like the bylaw appeals committee or another entity that exists in the organization uh, that could hear, hear these types of appeals. That just isn't in place because we haven't had one in the past, and so uh, that structure wasn't set up. But administration is intending to uh, move forward with uh, a proposal to council in the future to delegate this type of hearing uh, to a different body uh, to address the concerns that Councillor Sakachi has raised. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Taylor. That was all my comments, and I do appreciate that point of clarification because that uh, I think that that is very beneficial to the, the community. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hall. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mayor Kenneth. I thought you were going to Councillor Foss first, but um, yeah, I do have a few uh, questions to uh, either Tim or to uh, to Dave. Uh, first question: um, This one's probably to Dave. Can you explain? I guess the rationale for the the five year time frame um, that's placed in this bylaw, like why uh, why is that there? Uh, I actually um, I might ask Tim whether he could uh, comment on that as well. I can come up with a. Uh, uh, bit of a rationale, but I do know that Tim had spoken to uh, our consultant on this, and I wonder if he maybe got some information from the consultant on that matter. So the five-year term, I can answer this, thank you, Dave. Um, the five-year term is written in there um, to take in consideration of a property that's been vacant for five years uh, for property owners to renew or build within that five years. So if a house burns down today, it gives them that five-year gap to rebuild. Also on the other side of that is to ensure that uh, when we start uh, upgrading our infrastructure, it's based on uh, demand and other components. So the DCs need to be reapplied after five years for system growth. Uh, like I say, it's for the, the major infrastructure, not the pipes that are attached to the residential property. I hope that okay. helps you, Mr. Hall. Yeah, that does. Thank you very much, Tim. And, and next question, um, have we ever provided, I guess, an exemption or waived these fees before? I know we haven't, uh, you know, got to this, uh, you know, this hearing uh, before, uh, but have we ever provided an exemption or, or waived these fees, that, you know, similar to what's being asked tonight? 
I will answer that. As far as I know, uh, I'll say no, there haven't been a waiving of the DCs. Okay, thank you. Um, and next question, and from what I understand, uh, Tim, the uh, the PUC, um, you know, uh, is already working with Mrs. Evans, I guess, uh, you know, to allow her to move forward. Uh, so, she, you know, she didn't have to pay these fees uh, in order to get a building permit and, and move forward with the project. Um, but uh, you know, will you will you be and will the PUC continue to work uh, uh, with uh, Miss Evans? So you know, maybe you know, you know, after this decision tonight, whether whatever, whatever way it goes, you know, that she won't have to pay the uh, you know the fifty two hundred dollars in a lump sum. Is there is there some flexibility that's possible there? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the PUC can work with Miss. Evans um, to find a term of payment, uh, but in knowing that uh, the PUC then becomes the administrator of that payment cycle uh, and not uh, Chatham Kent uh, the Financial Department, so that becomes a task of the PUC to be able to do that. So I, if it's Council's wish, I can certainly work with uh, Mrs. Evans to find the payment terms. Okay, thank you for that, Tim. Would you need that specific direction, like in the in the motion, or was that something that uh, we can just ask? I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, Mr. Chair, it's David Taylor. If I could comment on that, yes, please do. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I would uh, recommend that Council include that matter in the um, motion. Uh, there isn't a provision in the bylaw already existing for administration to offer those types of uh, payment plans. And so while it may happen from time to time where we're trying to resolve a debt or something like that, where we offer payment plans in order to uh, resolve that, uh, where we're already on the Council floor now, and if that's Council's will to offer a payment plan, I'd recommend that be included specifically in the motion. Okay, thank you very much, Dave. And and one uh, one other quick question before I uh, uh, pass it along to the rest of council for questions. Um, and this actually comes from someone from the community. Um, question to you, Tim, or maybe Dave. What do we charge when there's builds for Habitat for Humanity? We would be applying the same rules as a regular home. Okay, thank you. Those are all my questions right now, Mayor Canna. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Foss, followed by Councillor Latimer. Councillor Foss, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. Okay, thank you. you Sorry go. about that. No worries. Uh, uh, Tim, my question is to uh, uh, how often have we been doing uh, development? charges on uh, homes five years old or older or vacant lot five years old or older thank you mr mayor uh to my knowledge uh i checked with the director of uh, engineering compliance uh, robert nardi and to both of our knowledges uh we don't think we've ever had a property that's come to us with five years or older on a redevelopment like this so basically, so this is the first time that this development charge has been charged, then is that right? To both of our knowledge, yes, it is. Okay, thank you. Councillor Latimer. Thank you, through the mayor. I'm not sure where this question would go, but it, again, it's process. Um, Ms. Evans says that her real estate agent and as well as their lawyer ensure that the lot was serviced prior to purchasing and that there was no financial underlying line issues. Is there anywhere in the permit process whereby this is this is uh, written? Or, or is it, I'm sure it's not just implied. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so the DC bylaw in 2019, when it was last uh, passed, amended and passed, uh, it was posted publicly and it was uh, passed at council as a DC bylaw. So it was, uh, it's been known. It is actually in the building department that applies the DCs on the permit for uh, building is when it, where it's, where it's uh, applied. Um, so not to say that it's, it's not hidden, it's uh, totally out in the public and it's been uh, advertised. It may well be advertised, but 
if you're not building, you're not paying attention. So again, if I were going into the building department, I would be looking for information um, and for people, for individuals to steer me clearly and, and uh, tell me what are my costs going to be. So was that there if, when Ms. Evans, when her real estate, or she went in, she says she wasn't told. I don't know that. I wasn't there. But is there something, again, is there a, a checklist or um, uh, information that's given when you get your permit that tells you that that is going to be applied when you go to pay for your permit? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't know. So, so we do have our DC bylaw posted on our Chatham Kent Public Utilities website. Uh, we have a pamphlet within the building department that the building department uh, can hand out at, if their information is requested on any permits and fees. Uh, so the information is there and available. Uh, but at the time of anybody investigating whether whether the, what a building permit was all about, that's when the DCs would be. Uh, uh, given that information, the person will be given the information on the DCs. So do we know in this case whether or not that actually happened? I don't know. I'm just asking. Uh, was that from her, from Ms. Evans' letter, it seems that she was not told or she wasn't given the information, or if she was, perhaps it was overlooked. I'm just wondering if we can't make it a little more um, um, obvious in the in the permit process that people know what the development charges are on their the initiative that they're they're trying to get a permit for because it's not ordinary knowledge and and i think i've, I've talked about this before um uh, during council with mr Lass with mr lacina and other council members thank you mr mayor to my knowledge uh when this applicant came in for the building permit they were told about the dcs at that point when they came in like any other uh, person trying to build a home or build a, a, a apartment within chatham kent would be told of the dc and how it would apply to them and the costing that's not how i read her letter but thank you very much tim uh councillor finn Just one question. Would it make a difference if there was part of a foundation that was left on that property? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, if the building was not demolished and the property was not vacant, uh, then the DCs would uh, then not apply. No, I'm just speaking like how some had just concrete slabs as a foundation. If that was still remaining on that property, would these DCs apply? Uh, maybe Dave can help me on this one, but uh, the way I see that the way the DC bylaws apply, uh, the building uh, has to be there and not demolished. It can't be considered vacant property, is what I'm saying. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I can add as well. Uh, just it goes a little bit to the uh, discussion uh, that Councillor Latimer was having as well. Uh, the presumption, first off, in the bylaw is that development charges are going to apply uh, to a property, but there's an exemption that then provides that if there was previously a building and it was demolished within the last 60 uh, months, that there is a provision for uh, reducing those development charges. Uh, the um, wording in the bylaw about demolition that talks about demolition uh, in whole or in part of a principal dwelling or a principal building. So uh, I, I think that there's a good argument that it would apply in that uh, case, uh, uh, Councillor Finn, but certainly, you know, that factual debate in an individual context about whether dem demolition was sufficient to get into the uh, uh, provisions of this bylaw is something that would have to be reviewed in those facts, but those aren't the facts this case, uh, as I understand them. Okay, thank you. At can I speak point? to that? Uh, this is Bev. Uh, uh, can I speak to that? Uh, yes, please do. Oh, just just uh, curious. Um, 
I asked if there was a demolition permit for this house back uh, before the foundation, anything was done, while we were still waiting for St. Clair Conservation Authority to approve it. And they said there was a demolition um, permit. Um, the, when they come to do the foundation, they did find a foundation. And I asked the city, well, if there's a demolition permit, wouldn't the previous owners, wouldn't they have had to take everything off the lot? That includes the foundation. And I was told, no, they don't, as long as they leave it in a decent shape. So yes, when they put in our foundation, there is a foundation wall about, I don't know, three, four feet from our new foundation. So I'm just clarifying that. And no, I did have no idea about the development fee and neither did the lawyer when they did a, a title search. I found out about it when Frank, forget his last name, sent me the, said the permit is ready and it's gonna be 7,700. That's when I found out about these development fees. Thanks. Okay, seeing no other questions, uh, what is the will of council? Councillor Hall? Thank you, uh, Mayor Canopy. First, um, if I can make a couple quick comments, I, I'd just like to thank uh, Mrs. Evans for, you know, for her comments tonight and, and reading her letter to council and sharing this information. Um, I, I'd like to make a motion, which hopefully can help alleviate some of, uh, you know, the financial concerns uh, that Mrs. Evans has uh, brought to light uh, in her letter and, and to council tonight. Um, and, you know, which will help her allow to, to move forward with this project and get uh, her family member a, a place of their own. Um, but at the same time, I guess not uh, not setting an un unnecessary precedent um, with this. So with that said, um, I move that one council dismiss the complaint in regards to 432 Agnes Street in Wallsburg. Two staff be directed to work with the property owner of 432 Agnes Street in Wallsburg to explore other financial aids and supports available through the federal government, provincial government, and other potential financial streams through the municipality, such as affordable housing accessibility, public health for seniors or other avenues. Three, staff be directed to compile the information and potential financial supports, which could be shared to help applicants in similar, situa similar situations across Chatham Kent in the future. And four, the PUC be directed to work with the property owner of 432 Agnes Street on a payment plan moving forward, if desired by the property owner. And that's so moved. Uh Councillor C. McGregor, can I get you to second that, please? You certainly can. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Hall, any comments? No, I think I, I, I mentioned my comments at the at, at the start, so uh, that, that's all. Um, thanks, Mark. Okay, uh, Councillor Bondi. Uh, thank you, Mary Kenneth. I'm just regarding the um, the motion from Councillor Hall. Do we know the answers to these questions? Like, is there these kind of programs or appeal processes? Are are they out there? Like, you know, rather than you know, passing them, which I do support wholeheartedly. But do we already know if, if that's the case? And maybe uh, Mr. Sutherland can answer that for us. Or is this just an up or down? Like, it's like it's a it's a fee, and it's either paid or it's not paid, and there are no appeal processes i'm just curious but i do support the motion um i just would like to know if 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 the motion's possible if somebody has that answer and I'm, I'm not sure that but that's why i'm asking thank you thank you mr mayor maybe i can start with an answer on that one um all right councillor bondi are you asking do, you know, do I have knowledge of any programs that are out there that can do financial support to uh, Ms. Evans? Is that what you're asking me? Uh, thank you, Mayor Ken. No, not so much if there are programs that can help Ms. Evans. I'm sure there are programs somewhere, but but um, when there's a, an appeal of the costing, is is there, I'm sorry, I'm sort of stumbling here, but is there a, uh, a a deferral on the cost or is it just a simple yes or no? I guess it's the simplest way for me to put it. Like, or can we put this off as Councillor Hall is suggesting that 
you know, perhaps there's ways that we can find some sort of different paths and some provincial, federal alleviation to this cost? Or is it just simply um, like a dog tag? You either pay it or you don't pay it. Sorry to be so simple about it, but, you know, I, I, I'm just asking. It's getting kind of in the weeds and a little complicated. And, and I hope Councillor Hall is correct, but I don't know if he is, and that's why I'm asking the question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The DCs are applied. Uh, you, you pay them, or they don't apply to you. Uh, the administration has uh, applied all the rules uh, for the DC bylaw according to this property. So it's uh, you pay it, or it's 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 exempt from the according to the DC bylaw. It falls under the exemption portion. And this okay, one is Mr. Shropshire. Mr. Shropshire has some comments as well. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, as I read. Uh, the proposed motion, the uh, financial assistance that we'd be looking for would apply to uh, a wider array of services and just the development charges. So I think we'd be looking at other ways to provide some financial support to help the family get established. Uh, I don't think it's just specific to the development charges. So I would be uh, looking to work with Dr. Reet Dyke and her team to uh, review the case and see if there's any way we can provide additional support. If that's not the intent of Councillor Hall's motion, then I'd, I'd appreciate um, clarification. But my understanding is we're trying to find a way to help the family uh, overcome the financial hardship that they're facing. Yeah, Thank you, Mary. And if I, if I can still just continue, if that's okay. Sir, I just wanted to have Mr. Sutherland, Sutherland uh, confirm number four that uh, the PUC could actually do a payment plan because I think that's part of what your question was is can these things happen so Mr. Sunderland uh, can you confirm that number four you can do? Thank you Mr. Mayor. Number four we can do on the direction of council which has been provided tonight through this motion uh, once passed. Okay back to you Councillor Bondi. Uh, thank you Mary Caniff. Number four yes I agree I think that that's logical and plausible but as far as um the other th the, the initial three i think maybe we would be setting some sort of a precedent if we say as council well you know you, you can't afford this and we're going to find some sort of alternative means to help you out like this is a new home build right so you know lumber was expensive i read that in the report and you know, unfortunately, that's very true, and many people have experienced that. But, but if we, you know, try and subsidize this, and I feel, you know, for Miss Evans, I understand the the plight, but, but won't everybody come forward and say, well, you know, geez, this was pretty expensive, and you know, I, I would like some help. I just think we're opening up a gigantic floodgate. Um, as far as like a payment plan, well, sure, well, that that's reasonable. I'm sure there would be some sort of interest applied to that like everything else that has a payment plan but as far as looking towards uh dr Rydick and um i think then we're going down the path of subsidization on a new build well you know we're gonna get a, we're gonna hear about this a lot because everybody's gonna face this and uh i guess that's my concern is that you know subsidizing this or finding some sort of program some publicly funded programs to again alleviate this sort of fee and cost well everybody's gonna ask for it like why wouldn't you like you know everybody's gonna run into these sort of issues so i am just sort of questioning that Thanks. yes I, yes i i believe that the uh, i'll go to councillor hall to confirm this but uh, i believe that number two and three are directed towards existing programs that anyone could apply to in a similar circumstance so councillor hall can you confirm that Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, it, it's not uh, it, it, absolutely something that's already existing. Uh, you know, just helping with this situation. Um, it's not looking to uh, you know with number one in the motion. You know that dismissing the complaint that you know basically means that uh, the development charges should be paid. Um, you know, but I think uh, number two and three is just to uh, you know look at some other programs that are already there. You know, like uh, like I know the Miss Evans mentioned that. Uh, uh, the person that's going to be moving into it uh uh you know has some accessibility issues so maybe there's some th you know things that i don't know off the top of my head but maybe there's some al already some programs in, in place uh that could uh, alleviate uh this particular situation but uh 
you know, it doesn't open up the the can of, uh, you know, just waiving these uh, development charge fees, which uh, which I don't think is uh, something that we want to do. So hopefully that uh, explains it. Thank uh, you, Mary. Councilor Bondi, does that take care of your question then? Well, not quite, but um, I, I guess what I'm asking, are, are these programs, or, or potentially, are these programs, um, or I'm reading the uh, motion, financial aids and supports available through the federal government, provincial government, et cetera, et cetera, are they available when this is a private bill? This is not public housing. This is not, you know, um, an initiative that's supported by the municipality or the province. Like this is a private bill, right? So like, I, I, and again, I don't know, but I'm just asking rather than waste everybody's time, including Ms. Evans, would I'm any program, problem. you know, apply to like a private bill asking for financial aid? Cause it's, it's not a public or sorry, it's not of a, it's not a, affordable housing initiative brought through the municipality or the province. So this is a private build. So I, I don't, I don't know that this stuff's out there, but I'm again, just asking. Count, Councillor Bondi, it's uh, Don Schraub for the chief administrative officer again. Um, if someone is building a private home, uh, Dr. Reed Dyke has uh suggested that person probably would not qualify for financial support for the reasons that were mentioned a few moments ago however there may be some additional support that could be available maybe people could be donating furniture there there could be other types of supports available in the community and i understood the intent of councillor paul's motion is there would be a requirement to pay the development charges however if there were additional supports that could be offered to the family uh, then those would be made available or suggested and that same type of support could be something that could be shared with with other family units. So it may not be a program, you know, we, we've not had the opportunity to do a uh, uh, any casework with the family to determine what their, their needs or qualifications might be. Uh, the intent of the motion is that we, you know, we'd be in a position where we'd have to explore that. But um, <clears throat> as I say, if they can afford to build a house, then generally you're not uh, eligible for type of financial support for most of our programs and thank you mr canifan thank you uh or sorry mary Canifin. and don so i think i think we're sort of drifting away from the puc charges when we you know are now talking about different support systems and the donation of furniture and you know maybe a gofundme or something like that but but tonight i believe we're talking to the puc charges and only the PUC charges. So I don't want us to drift into, you know, some sort of other, you know, funding mechanisms and community goodwill. Because tonight, I think the question to council is, do we do we waive the PUC fees? Correct or not? I just want us to, you know, kind of stay like in our lane here on this end. But thank you. Okay, we have a number of other questions. I'll start with uh, Councillor C. McGregor, then followed by Councillor Latimer. Thank you, and uh, through the mayor. And um, I guess number my first question would be um, um, through you to um, Tim Sunderland um, with the PUC. If, if this passes and you're directed to 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 do this, will this just inevitably go over to like? say onto the tax roll, onto the taxes in the same manner that we would offer plans or payment for, um, you know, for our, our citizens within the community, if a water line was going in or waste and water were going in. Um, I know when the water line went by my house, that was an option um, that uh, you could pay it over, over so many years. So does that just then inevitably go to our tax department? Um, it's not something that you have to set up directly through the PUC, is it, and then put through the uh, the waste and water bill? That would be my first question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I will ask uh, Gord to uh, come in on this question because he, he's going to be the one that needs to uh, uh, answer this one. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think uh, the the difference is uh, it's a water line uh, that's passed by a bylaw that comes back to council after after the water line is put in. Uh, council passes a bylaw to put it on the taxes. Um, this is a an amount owed to the PUC. I I, I think it is correct for the PUC to look after the collections uh, of this and. Um, it, you know, if, if this was to pass uh, uh, on uh, number four, um, to come up with terms that they can agree on, and um, and that the PUC collect on on those terms, whether it's a, you know, whether it's over six months or whatever terms are negotiated. Okay, if, thank, if, you. Oh. thank you. Oh, thank you, Gordon. That's that's kind of what I was saying. It had to be a side agreement. Okay, so in, in other words, then it would it would end up on um basically a water bill as opposed to a tax bill i don't I get it so i, I don't know of an invo that more of an invoice type of situation that the puc would would uh okay perfect and they are, however they like okay i just wanted clarification there so fine thank you um and then items number two and three i think this is a really good idea and you know i think it's unfortunate that that when you know somebody goes to do a build that that and and I don't see any possible way to even change that, but I think it's unfortunate that 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 information is found out after the fact. Um, and but for the information that I see Councillor all asking for and asking our staff to do, I don't see this any different than assisting um, our community, whether they're looking or or looking for grants or whether you know, if we have the information there and we can help them and direct them, I think that is part of what we do as a municipality to help our, our citizens within our community. So um, I thank Councillor Hall for, for bringing this up. And, you know, I don't think that, that that this needs to be pulled apart. I don't think it's confusing the matter. I think it's going to be much worse if we have to turn around and bring a motion to open council and deal with it on two separate nights and stretch it out and go through this all over again because we will if if it's not dealt with within this motion at this point of time so um i very much support the motion that he's brought and uh, and i hope other councillors will too thanks councillor latimer followed by councillor solomon thank you through the mayor um i also agree uh with uh, keeping number two and three there, I see it as a, a regular thing that we do for all our residents, or we should be doing when they call and ask us for assistance. Um, just for Councillor Bonnie's information, there are federal and provincial accessibility funding programs uh, specifically for seniors and accessibility um, for new builds and for retrofits. And we we do deal a lot more through the municipality, I think, with, with the retrofits and with uh, the lower income and keeping people housed but um it would be worthwhile um for staff to um i think it's a good exercise for us to have that list and and, and compile it so that we have that ready to assist residents when they come in and and hopefully there will be more of this I, I think it's a good idea where we've we've got property sitting somewhere and and we are actually um wanting to house uh our older um individuals who who want to live independently and so i i think we again this speaks to making the process clear in this case i'm not it, it it's uh, there's no reason to think that the information wasn't proffered before uh, but it, it wasn't it wasn't remembered or it wasn't clearly laid out and so it was a surprise and so I'm I'm uh, accounting on staff to clean that up a bit um, but I am I am in um, agreement with this recommendation that we're currently um, voting on tonight and I thank Councillor Hall for his work on it. Mayor Kano, could I respond please? As I was mentioned in Councillor Latimer's comments. Uh, yes, go ahead then. Thank you. Uh, and again, thank you, Mayor Kenneth. Again, what, what I was <clears throat> proposing, uh, suggesting, I agree with number two and I agree with number three, but I think we're drifting away from the issue. The issue is should the PUC 
charges be alleviated or not. That's what we're talking about tonight. We're not talking about funding for accessibility or funding for, you know, whatever, you know, kind of like housing somebody wants to build, which there's all sorts of programs and different things out there. Tonight, we're talking about the PUC chart. And I think we should stick to that. Like, that's, that's what we're here for. We're not talking about, you know, programs that would help the build of this new home. Tonight Given is about that, the PUC. Councilor Bondi, would you like two and three separated and voted on separately? Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right. We'll, uh, we'll set aside two. So we'll vote for one and four together and two and three together. Okay, uh, Councillor Salmon, then the final comments from Councillor Hall. No, thank you, Your Worship. That's what I was going to suggest, that we do one and four together and two and three together. And um, yeah, this is a unique um, evening for us since this is the first time we've done this and maybe the last. Uh, but it's not, this isn't, this is a, we're sitting to make a decision on an appeal and not, not it's not a social engineering discussion but so let's i'm quite happy that uh, you're going with one and four and two and three and we'll work it out quickly i hope okay uh councillor hall the final word yeah no I've, I've said all my comments uh thanks mayor caniff uh um it's uh, happy to vote hoping for support Okay, so we'll be voting on first number one and number four together. And we'll it'll take a minute to get that on the screen. Okay, so we're ready with the, it's not on the screen, but we're at the voting is set up for number one and number four combined. All votes are in. Motion passes. And now we'll vote on number two and number three. And all votes are in and motion passes. So with that, we'll move into, is there any note, new notice of motion? No, oh, there isn't any uh, non-agenda business. Anyone for non-agenda business? Uh, uh, Councillor Salmon and Councillor Hall, do, did you have your hand up from before or do you have uh, non-agenda business? Yeah, sorry, I, I haven't put it down. No, I don't. Thanks, Mayor Cannon. Uh, Councillor Salmon, do you have anything non-agenda? Okay, uh, Councillor Harrigan. I was not on there. I, no, I, my hand is up to move first and second reading of the bylaws. All right, you're, you're in for that. Hi, Mary Kenneth. I think you called on me for non-agenda. Uh, I just wanted to wish all of my female colleagues and also all of the uh, women uh, across Chatham Kent a happy International Women's Day. It was really inspiring today to see all of the uh, quotes and comments and uh, thinking back on the uh, the history of gender equality, where we've come is um, inspiring and where we are going is certainly uh, exciting. Thank you. 
Thank you for that, Councillor Harrigan. Uh, with that, we'll move into the first and second reading. Uh, Councillor Salmon, Councillor Pinsono. Uh, Your Worship, I'd like to move first and second reading of the bylaws so I can, because I have to make dinner very shortly okay. for my wife. We, we, just say yes no. and you've done it. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's an interaction. And I'll second okay. it, Your Worship. Okay, uh, anyone opposed? Motion carries. Uh, reading of the third bylaw, Councillor Foss and Councillor Kirkwood White. So moved. So seconded. Anyone opposed? Uh, hearing none, uh, motion carries. A resolution of council, Councillor C. McGregor. Thank you. And through the mayor, I would move that Chatham Kent Council adjourn to its next meeting to be held on Monday, March 22nd, 2021, and that Chatham Kent Council authorize itself to meet in closed session on that day to discuss any matters permitted by the Municipal Act. Uh, Councillor Finn, can I get you to second that, please? How about Council McGrail? I will second. Anyone opposed? Hearing none, motion carried. Uh, the resolution of Council, uh, Councillor Harrigan and Councillor Beam. Oh, sorry, we've already done that. We're, we, are, we are way ahead of things. All right, happy Monday, everyone, and happy International Women's Day. And we'll talk to you the next meeting.